All right, my name's Matt Barr and you're listening to episode 47 of the Looking Sideways Action Sports podcast. Da, da, da. Episode 50 is getting ever closer. Unbelievable, Jeff. So this week, I've got over my aversion to Skype chats for only the third time ever to conduct an interview, long range, via the wonder of the internet, with the Canadian snowboarder and Olympian Spencer O'Brien in a conversation that we'd been trying to organise for at least for at least four months, I would say. We finally got a date together, managed to uh, circumvent a few fairly annoying technical difficulties and, uh, yeah, get it together. So who is Spencer O'Brien? She is one of Canada's finest and most high-profile snowboarders. I would say she came onto the scene about nine or ten years ago, and it's fair to say up the game, really, in one of those seismic leaps that take place in action sports whenever a new generation turns up and decides to drag the sport forward in their own image, really. Um, Spencer is definitely in that camp. She upped the game, basically, by uh, taking a repertoire of sevens and later nines and switched backside spins onto the biggest kickers and doing it all with style grace and an extremely appealing kick-ass attitude. So throughout her career, she's also been a long, ad- long been an advocate of equal rights for women snowboarders and has basically fought the good fight and led from the front, you might say. She's also synonymous with competitive snowboarding, winning world champs, both FIS and WST. I think that's what it's called these days. Very hard to keep up. Um, she's won X Games and there's there's countless podiums among that CV. So there's your background. Uh, if you've been following competitive snowboarding, you'll also know that Spencer competed at the 2018 Olympics in both slope style and big air and was it's fair to say an extremely outspoken critic of the entire event particularly the now infamous women's slope style final if you don't know about this or you didn't really follow any of that then it's worth um, navigating your way to my to my website www.wearelookingsideways.com and reading the show notes to refresh your memory or get up to speed there because it was quite a big deal in the snowboarding world as you will uh, discover And Spencer was so outraged by the whole thing that she was moved to pen an open letter, giving her unique insight into the whole Farago. Now, this was eventually published after the Games on a US website. But at the time, as she was wondering what to do about it, I actually ended up speaking to Spencer on a couple of occasions as she wanted to run it past a few people to get their opinion and make sure the message she wanted to convey came across in the right way. So we chatted a few times um, right at the... In the heat of the moment, you might say. And then together with our mutual friend Gerhard Gross, she put together the piece that was eventually published. Again, hit the show notes to check that. Now, looking back at that, it's a powerful and outraged piece of work, really, that offers a unique insight into, as we put it during our chat, the thorny relationship that we snowboarders have with the Olympics. If you if you are a snowboarder, you're going to know all about that. And I wanted to speak to Spencer for the show to basically get this unique insight she's got on the whole thing. Not just as a competitor either, but as a snowboarder generally. I mean, there's a lot of issues to explore on this topic, from the ins and outs of what went down during the event to the rather obvious questions that I'm sure struck plenty of people at the time, like why ride anyway? Why not boycott? What do you expect if you get into FIS events? And during these, during our conversation, we explored each of these many themes And Spencer's insights, I think it's fair to say, are extremely fascinating. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more detail. That's what the end of the pod is for, obviously. But yeah, that's why I was so keen to get her on the show and why I dusted off the old virtual mic to get her on over Skype. And the result is a really essential insight from the sharp end of competitive snowboarding from somebody who's been there, seen it, done it, competed in the best and worst contest snowboarding's got to offer. And uh, yeah, Here's what she's got to say about it. My chat with Spencer O'Brien on being a snowboarder at the Olympics. Enjoy. So, uh, so we did it. We got the te- we got through the technical difficulties, <coughs> yeah. and we've been chat we've been chatting about doing this for probably about three or four months three and months we, we finally we finally did it we finally got it together yeah we're here <laughs> how you doing you good i'm good yeah just uh been spending some time in vancouver um rehabbing and yeah just kind of enjoying some downtime 
Yeah, what's what's the rehab you've been doing? Um, I actually tore my ACL uh, this winter and had surgery in March. So, wow. Yeah. So how how's that been? Uh, it's been good actually. It's been going really smooth. Um, and yeah, I've never done had any injury before, so I was kind of like, when it happened, I was like, well, <laughs> probably about yeah. time. <laughs> about time. Yeah, had had everything else. So, and how did you do that? Uh, I did it at X Games, actually. Um, I bruised right. my heel and did that at the same time. They think I maybe had partially torn it already and was just didn't know. Right. Um, but you can't, you can't tell. So, um, yeah. yeah, we kind of found out right before the games. And it was just one of those things where it was like, well, not going to not ride. So, yeah. <laughs> went yeah. for and it. How, and how, how was it? Um, it was okay. I mean, it was definitely challenging, like, with the heel too um i almost feel like the heel was maybe good because i was more focused on that than on my knee because once right. i got to the open i was like i noticed my knee so much more and was like okay i can't i can't ride you can't actually do it yeah i mean you kind of used to it though right? i remember seeing you at the world champs in oslo that's got to be like i don't know six years ago seven years ago yeah yeah 2012 when, when, when you won and um i think you were because Weave is a good mate of mine, and he was, you you were you were riding through a lot of injury and pain then, right? In uh, that event. Yeah, I that was like nothing major, but like I just took like a massive slam in practice. Yeah. I was going <laughs> like Mach ten and basically caught my edge in the belly of the takeoff and like just slammed into the wall of the takeoff. It was probably the most <laughs> unlucky fall of my career. That one was was pretty bad, but I was just so beat up, like. I could barely yeah. walk. And I remember John was actually doing up my bindings for me because I couldn't bend over to do them up. And yeah. he was like my little angel that week. <laughs> my little yeah. hungover angel. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but that's, yeah, I mean, I guess what I mean is it's, it's, it's been part of the game, hasn't it? You know, yeah. sort of learning, learning to deal with these injuries and, and still ride and still perform, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, I mean, some people are more... I guess, vocal about them when they happen, but just how many people ride injured, um, especially for the Olympics. It's like, it's great. I had, a, I just like, I can, there's just so many people I know who have been to the Olympics with no ACLs. <laughs> it's crazy. Right. And just sort of get used to it as a, as a thing. This is what we're going to do. Yeah. I, I mean, for all, like, I guess, you know, you wait so long to compete at that event. It's like, you don't want to give up that opportunity. And I guess the, reward outweighs the risk on that one a little bit but yeah normally i mean any other event you you just go get surgery you don't you yeah. don't mess around with that one because you're at risk of doing so much more damage to your the rest of your knee but luckily i didn't do that so um i was pretty grateful to not make it any worse so what's the what's the sort of prognosis like how far into the recovery are you um, I'm two and a half months in now and I'm riding my bike outside already and I'm going to start strength training here pretty quick. So that kind of initial healing process is pretty much out of the way. Um, but it'll be like, I mean, really good is to come back super early would be six months, but I'm going to try and wait till seven till I'm riding and then probably eight till I'm jumping. So I'm hoping to be back in time for due tour, but, uh, yeah, it's just kind of got to kind of wait and see how it how it progresses and how it heals so far it's been super good and it's gone really really smoothly um so hopefully it keeps doing that and i'll be back riding in europe for the fall and are you quite good at just sort of coping with that downtime you know just because you sound quite matter of fact about it you sound you sound quite like ah oh, you know just gotta get it done <laughs> do the work like whereas yeah. i think if it was me i'd be like jesus like eight months like acl like what like because you know i'm not not probably suffered as many injuries as, as you have in your career you know is it, have you have you learned to to kind of cope with it a bit more easily uh yeah mentally I guess I mean yeah definitely and I think for me like my the injuries that have taken me out for the longest have been like weird little ones that have like a lot of uncertainty around them so I find when I get these big ones that are like they are very matter of fact it's like you have surgery at three months you can do this at six months you can do this at eight months you're back like it's it's just like a very clear, concise timeline, like barring any complications. But um, so I find I, I work really well when I've got like a good structure, like I know what's coming and what's going to be next. And it's the uncertain ones that I, I hate so much because you just right. don't know when you're going to be back. And 
Um, but yeah, and I think I kind of got like the eight month thing was definitely like, whoa, I don't think I've ever been off my snowboard for that long, but it is part of the deal and uh, you definitely get used to it after so many years of, of injuries. So have you got some plans for the summer that, that you can follow through now, presumably, cause you, the pressure's off in, in some ways. Um, yeah, like I, I was planning on taking the summer off from riding anyways. Um, I really like having a bit of a break from riding um, every few years just to like kind of reset. And I find I just ride so much better if I like, if I miss it a lot and then I'm so excited to do it again. Um, and I already have that feeling, which is a really good sign. Nice. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I was kind of planning on taking a bit of a break, like not going to Australia or New Zealand anyways. So it's kind of a good timing and uh, yeah, just going to try and get in some good time at home and um, get strong and healthy again and hopefully go on a couple surf vacations once I'm cleared to surf because that was nice. my plan this summer was to learn how to surf but then yeah. this happened <laughs> where, where are you going to go? Um, I want to go to Bali I think at some point um, but then we just planned a trip actually with the Weavers um, and Sani um, to go to Biarritz in France we've done that trip like four times so uh, gonna, when you when yeah. you going to be over there? Uh, we're going end of September, last like 10 days of September. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great time to be there, isn't it? Yeah. I'm excited. That'll be fun. I love it over there. It's so nice. Yeah. It's, it's wicked. I mean, maybe not the easiest spot to learn to surf, but, uh, Mm-mm. you know, no. yeah, but <laughs> Bali, Bali be good. Yeah. Maybe Bali first and then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then throw yourself into them beach breaks. Yeah. Yeah. But even if I can surf, I just like go in there to eat eat the food and drink the wine. <laughs> oh, it's so good down there. Yeah. I was, I was over there in September last year and it was, yeah, it was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Looking to try and get back there this year. Okay. And you've been, um, you know, spotted on the Insta, you've been sailing, right? Um, once. <laughs> ah, right. I kind of wondered if that was a thing. Um, I'm actually looking into t- to take lessons this summer. Um, I have always wanted to learn to sail. Um, I spent my childhood on the ocean. My dad's a commercial fisherman, so that's kind of always been like my, my other love, um, is the ocean. So it's always kind of been a life goal of mine to learn to sail. So I've got my sailing the basics book and I'm going to yeah, enroll yeah. in some, some classes here to like, just start learning how to sail like the little lasers and the small boats. And then hoping one day to have a big one and retire. <laughs> so you, you grew up in uh, like coastal BC, right? Uh, yeah, I grew up, um, on the, on the ocean. Like we grew up, uh, I was born in a really small town off of the Northern tip of Vancouver Island called Alert Bay, which is a really, really big fishing community. Um, and we lived there till I was four. And then we moved up Island to, um, or sorry, down Island to a town called Courtney, which is also on the water. So I spent my whole life on the ocean more or less. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we would spend summers on the boat with my dad. Like he fishes all summer. So, um, yeah, it was really cool. We got to see a lot of the BC coast um, as kids. And just, I guess that's kind of where I get my appreciation for the outdoors. And um, and then it's also why my dad was able to take me snowboarding so much was because he didn't work in the winters. So Courtney has actually the biggest ski resort on the island is in Courtney. It's called Mount Washington. It's actually where Darcy Sharp grew up riding too, which is pretty funny. Um, and ah, his no way. sister Cassie, yeah. um, and actually Brian Savard for anyone listening who is a yeah. diehard old snowboard fan. Well, uh, he's my era. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I grew up being like, I want to be like Brian Savard. <laughs> Good role model to have around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he was sick. I guess he still lives on the Island actually, but I've right. never, I've never met him. I would lo- actually love, probably fan out if I met him. Right. Um, but yeah, we grew up riding there and then in order to get to kind of any of the like provincial level events, we had to drive an hour, take an hour and a half ferry and then drive another four and a half or five hours to get to the resorts. So my dad would pick me up after school, like right when the bell rang, I'd like run to the truck and we would just like beeline it to the ferry to try and make, um, the ferry so we could get in. Um, at a reasonable hour and then the second awards were done on the Sunday straight back to try and catch the last ferry to the island so I could make it back for school on Monday and wow I don't know I can't even count how many times he did that for me and my sisters like 
uh, looking back, it was I'm like <laughs> it was a pretty amazing sacrifice to do that for your kids every weekend, especially when I wasn't even good. I sucked. <laughs> yeah, right. But well, he could probably tell you were stoked on it, right? Yeah. And we're, and, and we're loving it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So how old were you when this was starting to happen? Um, that was when I was about 11. Yeah, because my older sister, Megan, was already competing when I learned how to snowboard. Um, so pretty much my second year riding, I started going to the events with them. At first, kind of just to hang out, and then I wanted to compete, so my dad let me. And I remember doing my first um, half-pipe contest at Mount Seymour when I was, like, 12, and I didn't know how. I'd never seen a, like, I'd never ridden a half-pipe before, so, like, the day before was my first day in the pipe. Wow, just got stuck riding. <laughs> yeah, and I just, like, I remember I didn't understand dropping in. Like, I didn't know you had right. to, like, ride down the wall to, like, pumps for speed, and I thought it was fun to, like, air off the edge. So I was just right. airing off the deck into the flat bottom. That was like my first hit. Wow. <laughs> and then I don't think <laughs> That's I pretty funny. got out after that. But then I, someone later that day was like, you know, you have to like to ride the wall. <laughs> it's like, right. Oh, okay. So you actually like dro- using it as a drop to flat. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Which I guess is so pretty funny. good foreshadowing for what I ended up doing. <laughs> yeah. It's right. not meant to be yeah. in the half pipe. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So you just loved it. You love competing. You love the scene. Yeah. Yeah. I really like, I mean, obviously I got lots of times we got like a day off school, which was always fun. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, I just, I was always a really competitive kid. Like I just loved sports and, um, snowboarding was kind of the first one actually that I like kind of sucked at. Like I was pretty like naturally athletic. So, and from a small town. What did you grow up playing as a kid? Um, the biggest ones were volleyball and softball. Um, okay. Like I played more like competitive level of both of those. Um, but I had to quit volleyball really young because of snowboarding. And then I danced. I did basketball, field hockey, track and field, soccer, gymnastics. Like I you did literally tried everything. Like I just yeah, loved yeah. to be active. And I didn't really know snowboarding was going to be like anything um, until I kind of was about 14 or 15 and I had like quit volleyball, I'd quit dance, I'd like quit all these things so I could snowboard more. And that right. was right. So, that, so, so up, in, up until <coughs> that point, it was just, and it was like part of this general kind of sport in life that you were leading. Yeah, it was kind of just like, <coughs> it was really something we did as a family. Like it was right. none of my friends snowboarded. Um, and we would go up every weekend as a family and ride. And I rode with my dad and I went to contests because Megan did. And I mean, I definitely wanted to do good in them and I liked it, but I just didn't realize how important it was, I guess, to me and how much I loved it until I like quit all these other things that I really loved to do. Right. So I could do it more. And what flipped the switch? Um, yeah, I guess when I was like 15, um, slope style kind of started coming around and I like had these like pipe dreams of like going to the Olympics in Vancouver because Vancouver had just gotten announced as a host city. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And so it's a good age, good age for you, isn't it? Yeah. To sort of be thinking like good, you know, good ambition to aim for. Yes. And I, and I like, I liked pipe. I wasn't very good at it, but I, I liked it and I didn't like hiking. I really hated hiking. Um, but it was around when I was 15 that, um, slope style started becoming like an event that they would do at all these like little contests we go. Cause we did everything. We do border cross GS pipe. Like that was the weekend. If we're going to drive all the way there, you have to compete in everything. Do it all. Yeah. So, um, slope style started becoming one. So we started doing that. And then my mountain actually stopped building a half pipe too. So I spent like that whole season just riding park. And that was kind of when I like finally made some friends who snowboarded from like other parts of the Island. And it was just, I don't know. It just clicked with me. Like that was a hundred percent. Right. Why I snowboarded and why I wanted to be better at it and why I did it every weekend, I guess. Right. So So you started to sort of get more out of it, discover the community, get a bit of, get, get some ambition with it. And at what point did you start thinking it, you know, ah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting pretty good, you know? Um, I, yeah, I guess like that end of that season, um, I remember there was, uh, that season or the following, I can't really remember was, I think I was 15 and, um, I actually, 
um, got noticed by like R- Roberta Roger, who used to be a pro snowboarder as well. Um, sh- her and yeah, she was. She she has something to do with JP. <coughs> yeah, she's married to JP. I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. She was like on chorus and velvet back in the day, and yeah, um, she ripped right. She's yeah. a really good snowboarder. Yeah, she's sick, and she's from Vancouver originally. So yeah. I had always grown up like looking up to her as a rider, and uh, when I was about fifteen, I did this event up at Grouse, which had like a pro one after it, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I I won like the amateur rail jam that day, and then just kind of like snuck in to the other one. It was like a film. It was like a filmmaker showdown so you're supposed to be like with a crew but i just like kind of kept snowboarding and like no one said anything so right i just like shredded all day and it was so cool because i was like riding like with all these people that i looked up to like leanne pelosi was there and like all these old canadian treads that i just felt like always looked up to so that was like i remember being like one of the funnest days of like my snowboard life to that point and um, at the end of it, Roberta, I guess, had noticed me there. And she had just started her agency with Sean Kearns, Infamous. And, uh, yeah, they had to call me a couple times, but she wanted to represent me. So that was kind of when I was like, oh, like, maybe maybe I'm pretty good at this and maybe this could be something. And it kind of went from there. Yeah, yeah. I'd already had a few sponsors. Like, I was Flow for Burton. Um, yeah. But I feel like that was... <laughs> I bugged the local rep, Jeff Martino, for like two seasons straight when I had a bunch of last place finishes in half pipe. And I think he finally felt bad for me and gave me a snowboard. <laughs> right. Well, you got to do it. You got to hustle, aren't you? You got, yeah. to, uh, you got, you got to put yourself out there. It's part of the game, isn't it? Yeah, totally. It's how, it's how, it's how you start. Um, yeah. Get it. You know, the riding is one thing, isn't it? But if you, if, you, if you can talk about it and big yourself up, then yeah, it totally helps, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So... And and it sounds like you were competitive from the start, and I, I obviously mean that as in like you enjoyed competition. You know, like that was that was the forum that you were gonna follow in snowboarding. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess it was just like always a part of it for me. Like from day yeah. one, basically, I was competing, and <clears throat> I like I was a super competitive person. So or I am obviously <laughs> I still do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think it, I mean, I obviously knew about all the other sides of snowboarding. Like I was that kid that bought all the mags. I you geeked waited. out. I geeked out. Yeah, I waited. I was like, I loved Transworld. Um, like the forums. Remember when they, you could like yeah, yeah. just talk yeah. to people on the forums? Yeah. I like, loved like early that. internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the proper thing actually, wasn't it? Yeah, like, they, they were, were like, crazy. Pe- like kind of like pre-Facebook, wasn't it? And, and, and Instagram. So that was where people used to kind of argue about snowboarding, wasn't it? Well, yeah. And there was no, like, no way of tracking who anyone was. So like people yeah. were so harsh. Yeah. People got super harsh actually, didn't they? Yeah. It was kind of gnarly. I think it's really good that you like, it's linked to your Facebook account. So you can't be a total dick all the time. <laughs> Yeah, like proper Wild West of the internet, that wasn't it? Yeah, it's so day. funny. I remember spending like every day after school on those, just like geeking out on snowboarding and reading all the, the like the forums. But uh, yeah, so like I obviously knew about filming and, and everything. And <clears throat> there was a point where like I kind of decided to do contests instead of filming. And yeah, like I don't think I, at that point, I intended to snowboard or to compete for 15 years, but here here we are (laughs) yeah yeah here you are and were you starting to connect with the kind of wider canadian scene as well at this point because i mean the from from what little i know about it you know it's tight right the canadian scene like the canadian snowboarding community generally there's like a real there's a real closeness is that fair to say um yeah i think so um i think all i think back then too all of snowboarding was a lot closer um yeah like people who did like a lot of people crossed over they competed and they filmed and um a lot of people did all the like they did pipe they did rail jams they did big air slope and now i I, it's much more segregated now i feel like in general but yeah the canadian scene was really cool and it still is it's just um i think just having whistler it's like this little hub of of canadian snowboarding and um it's kind of a place you can go and you'll always run into someone, you know, and, uh, um, yeah. So I started spending a lot more time, I guess. Yeah. So that was the end of 
I don't know, I was 15. And then the next, like literally I started working with Roberta and that next year was my first year competing professionally. Like it was like right. such a Straight crazy, it. such a crazy jump. I was like so in over my head. I was not good enough. I oh, really, in t- as, as a snowboarder. Yeah. I mean, just compare Like I literally went from doing amateur events to doing Vans Triple Crown. And then yeah, wow, it's a proper hot house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like, like right, like there you go. Drop you in the deep end and hope you know how to swim. Um, yeah, but yeah, I remember that first event was in Tahoe, and like I had done all the M events. Like, I had one form young blood. I'd done all the local events. I'd won boardroom slope style here. Like that was definitely the next step. But snowboarding just didn't have any like there was no middle ground. Like you literally no. just were an am and then you had to go straight to pro and hope yeah. you figured it out. Right. So how did you cope with that? Um, <clears throat> well, I didn't do very good. My first few events, it was definitely like such a crazy transition. And I was like fanning out half the time because I got <laughs> getting to meet like Natasha Zurich and M4 Markser and like the Yen and Hannah Beeman and like all the, and Jana Mayan. Oh my gosh. I free, I was so excited the first time I like saw Proper Jana legend. in real life. I was like, Oh gosh, what am I going to yeah. do? Oh, but, like absolute icon. Yeah. I've, yeah. She's the, well, she's always been my favorite snowboarder. She still is. And, uh, but yeah, I remember being so nervous the first time I was at a contest and she was there. Um, yeah, but I think just like, I mean, having Roberta was really helpful. Like she really saw me through that first year and um, was a really good support person for me. And, and all the girls were really great. Like I had n- already met Leanne, so she kind of really took me under her wing and and just really like kind of guided me through those first couple of seasons on tour. And um, I think that's what's so cool about women snowboarding and is that like people will do that for you. Like they're not going to yeah. like, leave you hanging. Yeah, this is, again, not not to overuse the word, but there is that camaraderie, right, amongst amongst you guys. Like that's really that really that's always come across, and it it, it still comes across. I think. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Like that's probably like yeah one of the biggest. Well, yeah, one of the biggest reasons I probably still compete too is because there is that community and that camaraderie between the girls, and for sure we're competitive and everyone wants to win. There's no question, but it's like everyone is genuinely stoked like the olympics big air like people were so stoked when anna landed that cat double 10 like that just that day for for women's snowboarding it didn't matter who won or who lost it was like our sport just won like that was the craziest day for women's snowboarding and yeah i mean and we we talked obviously in the in the weeks before that because we were chatting about the open letter that you'd written and mm-hmm. and one of the things that really stood out for me about the the open letter that you wrote about the slope style final was you said a line that was you know we spend our lives being asked why we're not as good as the men Mm -hmm. you know like and and we have to justify our riding and that was almost one of the main things why it seemed you were so upset about what happened with the women's slope style final because you didn't get the chance to to sort of show the level of riding that women's snowboarding is now at and but as you say the big air final kind of did that didn't it it was like well actually this is the reality this is this is where the sport's at and gave you the opportunity to sort of showcase that right yeah I don't think we could have asked for like a lot of people actually hit me up during those weeks before I like released the letter or like even told many people about it and um they were like you guys should boycott like screw the olympics like everyone should just boycott big air and not do it and it's like I get where people were coming from with that, but I think we sent a much more powerful message by just showcasing women's riding and what, it, what we're capable of. Cause there, I mean, even the, I think even the qualifications was even a bigger show, like just to see that kind of riding from 24 women. It's like, I've never seen a field of girls ride that, that strong in my whole career. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, that's- in the end, that was the right message to send. Yeah, well, that's when something like the Olympics is working, isn't it? You know, like actually this is the so-called biggest platform on the planet. And yeah, on that occasion it works. But, you know, I guess what we're talking about is the kind of thorny relationship that the sport has with it really, isn't it? You know, it's it's not it's not a new thing really, like the, the kind of 
arguments about how snowboarding does get represented on that platform, essentially. Um, and obviously you've been in the in the thick of that, really, over the last few years. So how do you look back on, on it now? You know, it's a few, few months down the line. Obviously the dust has settled. What, what are your thoughts now um, on that event? I think they're still pretty similar. They're pr- still pretty strong. Like, I really feel like I'm like, I'm, I'm really proud of everyone for big air. And I think that was such a strong way for us to go out of the games. And, um, I think that event will be remembered for a really long time. And, and that's always the hard thing is like, um, you, you, you fear like that the ones like slope style don't get remembered and they're going to be brushed aside. And, um, I worry that it'll happen again. I actually don't really have any doubts that it won't happen again. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, I think snowboarding is an interesting place. Like we have had that thorny relationship with FIS and with the IOC since 98, since the games were put in. And, um, I, I, I see that kind of resistance fading, um, especially in the younger riders because they've only grown up doing world cups and we have so few independent events left that they kind of don't know how it can be. Or, any other way. Yeah, they don't know any other way. And, and it's going to get to a point where there, I think there won't be any other way. And that's a scary thing to me, to, to know that our sport could like potentially one day, everything from the competitive side will be under FIS. And it's not that FIS doesn't do an okay job. Like A lot of their events are good. And obviously, like, Lox opens a FIS event now and some Aaron Styles, and those still have the same organizers. They're amazing people, and they do an incredible job. And I know that they have snowboarding as the number one priority. But the thing is, is that we are never going to be bigger than ski racing, like, to FIS. And if that's our governing body, they're never going to do anything to elevate snowboarding past ski racing. Do you, do you think they even understand the problem as as you and you and I perhaps would would call it? No, I don't think so. But I think that's the thing. It's like the people who run fist snowboard, like um, you know, there are great people within that organization yeah, of that, course. that are snowboarders. Um yeah. but it's the people above them and it's it's I guess I just like look at the bigger picture so much more. Like I want to see snowboarding be like surfing. I want us to have like this sick world tour that people tune into every two weeks to watch and they follow it and they have a fantasy league. And it's just like, that to me is, is where snowboarding should be. And it's, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be on that same level. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That seems to be what everybody wants. You know, I interviewed Starla for this the other week and he said exactly the same thing. You know, he, he didn't put it perhaps quite as strongly, but he definitely said, you know, it's not snowboarding, basically. Mm-hmm. That isn't snowboarding, and we should have a tour that represents snowboarding. Why? Why do you think it's proven so difficult to accomplish that? Because it's not like people haven't tried. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think TTR got really close. Um. Like, I guess after 2012, like world. I mean, World Champs in Oslo were such an exceptional event. Like, I think from a a broadcast standpoint, like whatever that I can't is it tv3 I can't remember what the broadcasting was from from Norway for that but they did such an amazing job on that event and um yeah okay it all felt like it came together for that one yeah there, like, I mean there was like behind the scenes there were some issues like you talk to some of the riders <laughs> they would complain yeah. about a lot of things um we don't need to get into that but like I think from a putting it out to the world perspective it was done so yeah. well like the st- there yeah, was a the, live stream the broadcast yeah. in your in norway was amazing um the judging worked good yeah. i remember i liked the judging <laughs> yeah but i like that format you know that was this is the sls format yeah wasn't that it? was and one that, of the first times we did sls yeah and it was I, I liked that format you know as a spectator that was just watching that event i thought it as a snowboarder it makes sense you know like it it, it fits the you know don't want to call it like a ridiculous word but it fits the narrative of the event you know like and you get the competitive element to it so it's still a spectacle you know and i and 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 these are the things that essentially with the way that fist deals with it seem to get a little bit waylaid don't they 
you know, for whatever reason, like the, these things that, again, you know, that snowboarders seem to instinctively understand what's important about the culture of competitive snowboarding and the things that should be represented seem to get missed, don't they? This is, you know, it's, it's like it's not quite happening. It, it can happen, as we say, with the big air. It mm-hmm. totally happened then. Happened with the men's pipe this year. But mm-hmm. so many times it doesn't happen. You know, and and you know, it brings us back to women's slope, doesn't it? Because that is the the biggest, you know, fuck up of them all, really. F- f- since we've been in the Olympics, that's the one that's been the worst example of this, isn't it? Well, yeah, and I think I think just seeing their reaction to it as well. Like, I mean, I was literally standing at the top, just like, what are they going to say about us? Because so many times when it's weather like that, where it's sunny, but you can't really see the wind, it's like people are just like, oh, girls suck. I've had that a million times and it's just like, you don't, you're not there. You don't understand like how bad it was. And luckily, like I think every announcer across the board was on the rider's side with that. And I, I've re I've seen some of the stuff from BBC and some of the stuff from, from CBC in Canada. And like Craig really relayed that message that like, this is not normal and these girls should not be riding. This is super dangerous. And this does not reflect the level of riding because of the conditions. Um, So I think, but yeah, like for me standing at the top of that course, watching that, I had to leave the rider's tent. I like could not watch anymore. I was like, I want to puke. Like, this is like insane. What are we doing? And, but yeah, like that's your choice as a rider at the top is to either drop in and, and hope you get lucky and, and don't have wind and somehow put something down. Or join everybody else in the body bag <laughs> down the bottom. Well, I mean, that's you're kind of laughing, but people did get hurt, didn't they? I mean, that's yeah, the horrible thing. That's like, the thing. It's like yeah. I'm shocked more people didn't get hurt, to be totally honest. Yeah. But I mean, it was it was hard to watch for sure. I mean, there's people basically eating shit left, right, and centre. I mean, what's the stat? Like five out of the first uh, qualification run or final run, like five, five landed I runs. I think it was five runs total. Landed. yeah i mean that is just wrong isn't it yeah so do you in terms of the the process behind the decisions to run that event then as i understand it at, at a fist event there's no riders meeting right so it's like a team captain's meeting is that the way it works yeah the riders are welcome to go but it's really not like customary like like it's um it's a coach's meeting essentially like i don't know i've i've never gone to one I don't know many riders who have. Um, we we usually have pretty open lines of communication with uh, Robbie, the event director. I don't do a ton of FIS events, so like I'm not as, I guess, close with the organizers for those as I am with like Gunny from X Games and sure um, and the people from the US Open. Like, but um, yeah, I mean, typically I've I've even been to to FIS events where there's been super bad conditions. Well, and actually me and Tora had to storm the coaches meeting because they were deciding <laughs> if the girls should ride by asking the coaches. Right. And it's like, you can't ask people who aren't snowboarding. Like they're not out there. They don't know what it's like. You have to talk yeah. to the people who have to put their bodies on the line. And that's always blown my mind. Like it's fine to do a coaches meeting the night before and give the schedule and have the coaches relay any changes like yeah that's fine but when it comes to people's safety and whether or not an event should be run it has to be relayed through us and it was just shocking to me like the level of communication like there was none and even from my coaches like I never heard anything like it was just like okay practice is on and then I got back to the top and someone was dropping and I just had to go to a place where it was like uh, we just gotta go and that's this is happening whether we like it or not. And I mean, looking back, I wish I had a stood up. I wish I had a just said, talk, said to all the girls, like, do you want to do this? I mean, that's the obvious question that, that, you know, why did you ride then? Because my only other choice was to drop out and not compete at the Olympics. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe that's hard for people to understand that. Like, you give four years of your life to something and for like literally 30 seconds. So to like be in a position of being like, I'm just not going to try when everybody else is going, that's an impossible choice. And also it seems to me like you've been saying all along, it's, 
you, you you've not really been given this there's something wrong there because you don't have a say as a, as an athlete in the conditions and then you don't have the support from elsewhere to make the right decision do you know what i mean it's basically it's all on you it's like well here's the choice you either ride or you give up the olympics you know which just seems so drastic and so you know if, if it's coming down to that choice and there's that much pressure on you as athletes that just mm. seems like something is very wrong you know there's, it's, something's not not working properly there yeah there's a there's a big disconnect there and and that's the thing is you know at i mean it was an interesting year for all of this stuff actually i mean x games there was a lot of drama with half the field dropping out and that was a weird one for me because i've had a lot of times at x games and other events where we've ridden in really bad conditions um, but we've at least had a conversation about it and we voted as riders and I've been one of the people that's like, screw it, let's ride. <laughs> and then yeah. I've been the one who's gotten broken off. Yeah. Yeah. But it, and then, you know, to then to see us open, then cancel the event, you know, not like what, three weeks later because of, because of weather, it's like, you know, you like, that's how it should be run. It should be a conversation with the people who are competing and, and, and really, at the end of the day, there should be an event director who makes that call. Anyone yeah. who watched practice that day knew we shouldn't have rode. Like, there's no way. I didn't even make it through the course. Did you see um, Anna's coach Gigi's post on Facebook? I where did. He was saying, where he was saying he was the only one that raised it with the, is it Roman, the technical director? Yeah. And, um, and he was saying that, well, you, we, you can't even complain about the weather. <laughs> It's like, it's not even a thing. Well, yeah, that's even in the rule book. Yeah, you actually cannot even file like an official complaint. Yeah, so it's, which puts it all on the discretion of, of the technical director. Then basically, doesn't it? Like yeah. that's literally the only person that can actually make the call. And that's to, the person to, who should be because at the end of the day, like, I mean, that's how it is in surfing, right? It's like they made they just made that call in, um, not uh, not bells, but Margaret River. Um, yeah. Uh, the, their commissioner, there were shark attacks in the area. Nothing had happened at the event venue yet, but there yeah. were signs of shark activity and they were like, this isn't safe for our surfers. We're not even giving them a choice. They're not. Yeah. Going. When you put it like that, no the show must go on. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like, get in, there's get in a the lot water. of money on the line. I mean, I know they're not TV time, but I mean, that's still a lot of oh, money. That's, that's lucrative. That is so lucrative. Yeah. You know, there's a, there is a lot of money involved in that. Yeah, and they made yeah. the, they made the call for sure. And, and yeah, and it wasn't even like a like it, it, yeah, they just were like, this is what's best for our athletes. And there was actually ra- surfers who still wanted to go, um, but they were like, sorry, like we're not going to risk anyone. And that's how it should be. It shouldn't be up to us to like, you know, to even. I feel like it shouldn't even really be on the riders to decide if they want to put themselves on the line for that. Cause it's just, it's just not worth the risk. And we've had events like that. I remember due to her a couple of years ago, we showed up, I remember sitting on the chair, um, being like, Holy, this is going to be the sketchiest contest. Like it's only one jump, but it is so windy and it is so snowy. And like, you can't see three feet in front of you. Like this is crazy. And we got up and they didn't even let us practice. They were like, it's, we're like, if everyone's okay with it, we're just calling it. Like, we're not going to make you guys run in this. Yeah. And everyone was like, yeah, okay, thanks. (laughs) So what would you change to try and make sure it doesn't happen again in four years? Um, I think the biggest thing for FIS is that they, they need to develop communications with the riders. Um, it's all the TC meetings and everything. It's all good. And there is a lot of coach involvement at those events. You know, national teams are the backbone of, of that, uh, that tour, but there still has, I, I still believe like, you know, after the first day of practice, there should be a rider's meeting to talk about the course with the riders. Don't do it at eight o'clock at night somewhere else. Do it right after people have ridden it and talk to the people who ride it. Um, and you know, and then you can do your TC meetings with schedules and everything else later, it, you know, and, and if it comes down to rider safety, that should be in the rule book that there's an official meeting held with the athletes and maybe it comes down to an athlete vote or whatever. But I just think that you, you can't just make people go 
and then you can't turn around and blame it on them after the fact. It's which did happen, which didn't it, did happen, basically. yeah, because you know you're looking at 32 girls who this is their dream since they were little kids, and you're asking them to, you're putting it on us to just be like, no, we're not doing it, like, and when everybody knows the second someone drops, it's game over, like. They're not canceling an event after anyone, someone drops. Like, it's just, that just never happens. And that's what I knew. And that was when I made my choice to not say anything was because I knew that if I got fired up about it and I got going, like I've done that before at contests where I've like fought for the girls and I've been like, this is bullshit. We shouldn't be riding. And they've made us go anyways. And then I've ridden so poorly because I'm my, my head's not in the game. Like I'm focused on something else. And as an athlete, like, you have to like put the blinders on and go to work. And I made that choice at the Olympics. I saw people dropping in and I just said, I have to like put that out of my mind and I have to go to work because this is my one chance and I'm not, I decided to let it go and it was the wrong decision, but it, you know, I had to make that choice for myself and every, every girl did. Well, that, I mean, that leads me quite nice actually to the question I was about to ask you because you mentioned earlier that, you know, some of the younger um, women and girls on the tour, like kind of used to it, like used to the status quo now, you know, mm-hmm. used to fish running events, doing those World Cups. So how, how are they with this? Um, what was that? What was, I'm, I'm not asking you to speak for anyone, but like what, what was the sort of, because it's an interesting point, you know, like if obviously you're looking at this from your longer term perspective, but if there's younger kids and there were a lot of younger girls and women riding that event, you know, like what, did, how did they react to it? Um, I mean, I think like a lot of the girls, people, people were pissed. I mean, everyone was, all the girls yeah. were upset. And, um, I remember, you know, just even riding through practice, like people getting on the chair, just being like, what is like, this is bullshit. Like, what are we doing? Like people were just like freaking out. And then, but of course, like, I mean, I wish we had it just been like, no, when they postponed us like 15 times. Because, but then everyone, we, we get it. We've been there. We know that there's a, there's money on the line. There's TV time. It's the Olympics. Like it, it's not easy to reschedule something. And we understand that as, as riders and we're going to do our best and our part to like put on a show if we can. Yeah. I mean, that was Ed Lee's kind of explanation for it in his piece that he wrote for Transworld, wasn't it? That I'm sure you saw, Mm -hmm. but he, he basically just put it down to that. He basically put it down to the fact that it was either run it or cancel. So the fact yeah. the fact of the matter is they went for run it because of tv well and that's essentially. that's interesting because i i heard that and i've actually never gotten clarification on that but that at the tc meeting they told the coaches that apparently that it was run or cancel but i was never yeah really that's the that. phrase that's the phrase that, that i've heard a few times now and, and when speaking to people that were kind of around this you know and i don't think one rider knew that going in which is absolutely crazy well, yeah. So then, you didn't. So you didn't speak to Sonny about it at all. Well, so like, Sonny is my my coach, so he doesn't go to the TC meeting. So I'm not actually. I could ask him. I don't know. I've never asked him if he right. heard that or not. I don't think he did. And I should. I've never actually spoken to my, to the team coaches about it to my other coaches. Right. But yeah, um, I kind of heard that through the grapevine after the fact, and I was like, I feel like the coaches, like some rider would have known it. Like some coach must have. And Geeky yeah. never said anything about it in his post. So. I don't no, know if he only, didn't either, did he? If, no. I don't know if only a few people were told that or if that was like announced. I, I have no idea. But yeah, I definitely heard that after the fact. And I was like, again, why were we not told that? <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I mean, yeah. from, from bringing it back to the sort of snowboard perspective, obviously, as you said earlier, you know, like proper snowboarding geek. I mean, obviously, you're going to know the, 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 the arguments, like we said, that have been going for 20 years. And, you know, there's, there's definitely the argument made in snowboarding, which is like, well, kind of like, what do you expect? You know, basically, if you're going to get in bed with these people. I mean, I think even Terry a popped up again with an Instagram post, didn't he, around the time. Um, I think even like Sarah Lewis from Fist said it, didn't she? She was just basically a bit like, well, tough shit. You're getting a lot of exposure. Just deal with it, you know, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> Because well, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Because you've got her from the very extreme fist end, and then you've got Terry from the very extreme snowboarding, and kind of not for the same reasons, but kind of saying the same thing. I mean, 
again, you've got a unique perspective on that. What what do you think about that now? Um, yeah, I mean, I think they have a point, you know. It, we all dropped in. Every girl made a choice to ride that day. And I think there's a reason they didn't do a riders meeting because I think they knew if they got a, all of us in a room together, there's no way they could have made us go. Um, so I, I kind of feel like that's part of the reason it went down the way it did. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, again, like it, it's so, it's just so hard to like ask an individual to stand up and do that. And that was kind of what it was required. And, and Celia did. Celia actually went to, to Roman and, and asked him not to run it. Really? I think she was the only that. rider that actually spoke. I was looking for Robbie, but I guess he was on course. So I didn't see him. Um, cause I don't know Roman at all. I, I didn't, I always just thought it was Robbie, <laughs> but, right. um, and that was a big thing to me too. I was like, where were you guys? Like, why was no one at the top, like checking in with the girls, even during practice? Like where, who was I supposed to complain to? Yeah. Cause I like, and yeah, I guess it was that Roman guy, but I didn't know that. And I know Celia did. And so when they came out and said that no riders complained, like that is a lie. Um, right. And then Gigi obviously made a formal complaint for, for Anna and Austria. But um, I don't know, I guess, sorry, I kind of got off track there, but I don't know. I guess it's just really hard. I think, I think when you, when you have a group of people, it's, it's so much easier to kind of stand up together and to make that call together. Um, but when you separate people into individuals and, um, everyone is, everyone's there for themselves. Everyone's looking out for themselves, you know, and I'm sure there were some girls who were like, this gives me a way better chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, the standard is going to be lower. So, you know, yeah. but yeah. you know, it's, and, and that's the thing is if you're young and hungry and, and you just want your shot, like I'm sure there was a few girls who probably wanted to ride even. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know yeah. for sure, but I remember being in that position when I was younger being like, like I just wanted to go no matter what. But I think at the end of the day, when you get people together in a group, everyone's going to be on the same page and, and it's so much easier to stand up together than it is alone. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what ended, what ended up happening was they kept us apart and, and we never had a say as a group. So are you going to go again? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I thought you might say that. Yeah. Um, to be honest, like I never thought I would even go to an Olympics in my career. Um, yeah, it, it was just, that was something I gave up with half pipe and I loved slope and that was what I wanted to do. And, um, the Olympics had always been like a bit of a dream for sure. And um, it is an incredible experience and an amazing opportunity to represent something other than yourself, which I think is really special in a sport like snowboarding. That's so individual, but yeah, I really like, I mean, I didn't think I would go to any. And when Sochi came up, I was so ecstatic about that. And, um, and then that didn't go the way that I wanted at all. And, um, I made the choice to give it another crack and this one went the way it went. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not ruling it out. I'm still going to compete next year and, uh, um, kind of taking it year by year right now, as far as that goes. But I just think for me, my heart is really in the other side of things. It's in X games and us open and do tour and, um, Baker bank slalom. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think for me, that's kind of where my heart is with competing and, um, I've done the Olympic thing. It was great, but, uh, yeah, we'll see though. I don't know. Never say never, but I think at the moment I'm, I'm pretty happy with those experiences and just would like to finish my competitive career doing, doing it kind of for myself and the way that I started doing it. What I was going to ask you about next, if that's cool is, um, your, uh, your rheumatoid arthritis that you've been dealing with for a few years. Is that something you're comfortable with talking about or? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because you're, um, because you were just saying before we initially started recording that you're, um, you're off to Texas to do like a kind of like a, a talk about that with some other athletes, right? Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I have got this interesting speaking opportunity to go to a pharmaceutical conference <laughs> and, um, yeah, be on a panel with a few other athletes who also have chronic disease and kind of just talk about, I think our experience with, um, prescriptions and getting our drugs and how they, how they help us in our daily lives and for our sports. And, uh, yeah, so that'll be pretty interesting. I've never been to Texas, so, and I've never done anything quite like that. So I think it'll be a cool experience. So you got diagnosed with that, what, like four years ago? Is that right? Um, yeah, it was November, end of November, 2013. So right before the Sochi Olympics. Right. And did you put it down to just sort of wear and tear just from snowboarding? Did you just think, oh, well, you know, this is what happens when you're getting a bit older? Yeah, it was pretty crazy looking back. Like I remember kind of that fall before, like going into the Olympic qualification year. So 2012, 2013, um, I remember like I was training so much and I was feeling really, really strong. And um, I had just come off winning world champs in Oslo and I was just like really fired up for the Olympics and for that season. And I was like in super good shape. And, but I remember like warming up and feeling my knees so much, like they were just so sore all the time. And I'd have to like really get going before they kind of like eased off and were easier to move. Um, it was just like super achy and stiff. And I really like a hundred percent was like, man, I'm just getting older. Like I'm almost 25. Like it's just part of the deal. 25 <laughs> grand 25, old well, age. You know, you snowboard <laughs> for, for uh, however many years and it's like, okay, that, that's probably par for the course. Yeah. But, I still um, pretty young though, it? Yeah. That, that season was really weird. It, it just went downhill really quickly. I remember starting to ride and, and it just being way harder coming back. Like, you know, you're always sore the first week when you've taken some time off, but yeah, but it didn't go away. Yeah. I remember being like extra, it being like kind of harder to get up in the morning, harder to warm up and harder to get going. And, and then I started getting just random joint injuries. Like early that season I got, um, bursitis in my shoulder. So I started having like, I couldn't do like front boards cause I couldn't put like my, my front arm behind me. Right. It would like hurt so much. I'd like pull it back. And then what, what, what did you say it's called? Bursitis. Bur- bursitis. So yeah. You have like right. a capsule around all your joints and it bursitis is when it fills up with too much fluid and becomes irritated. And right. It just like hurts. Okay. Basically. Yeah. Um, so I got that and then because I had that, I couldn't train my arms very well. And then I got atrophy, which is when like all your muscles die. Which happens and quickly, doesn't it? It's like very, very quickly. Yeah. yeah. And I remember there was a point, like there was multiple points throughout that season. And I actually had a, we had just found out that I had like torn a bunch of ligaments in my wrist like a year before. And I, that took like a long time to diagnose. So we're like, okay, we're going to get through the season and then we're going to have the wrist surgery and we're going to be like 100% for the Olympics. Like that's the goal. So right. I like pushed through that season, qualified for the games. Um, but I remember there was like points when I was competing and I like couldn't lift my arms above 90 degrees. <laughs> it's like, wow, what am I doing? <laughs> wow. But I just thought it was, and I ended up getting like, like a few cortisone shots and just like anything to make it through that season and, um, ended up getting the wrist surgery in, in early May and, uh, was, yeah, just like full blown, like rehab mode, like let's do this. But it, it quickly became kind of like a one step forward, two steps back and my shoulders, I just like, they just would not get better. And I, I literally couldn't like, I could barely lift the weight of my arm above my head. Like it was so difficult. Um, and we just thought it was from the atrophy and the bursitis and we thought it would get better that now that I wasn't riding and it just, I, yeah. And then it, it just kind of snowballed from there. There was like, I had a Baker cyst in my knee, which you don't get unless you like have torn your something in your knee. Cause it's like a symptom, but then I couldn't bend my knee for like two months. And then I got capsulitis in my toes when I started riding again in Australia. Wow. And, and like, that was like, I felt like such an idiot, like seeing people and people being like, why aren't you competing? Like what's wrong with you? And I was like, my shoulders hurt and my toes are sore. Like, I don't know, <laughs> right? but it really, really fucking hurts like all yeah, the time. Yeah. And it's crazy with chronic pain. Like you really just, you push it down and you push it down and you push it down and you just like, you don't realize how much it builds up 
and yeah. how much it starts to affect you mentally. And, and, you know, I, I couldn't, I got to a point where I couldn't sleep. I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. I couldn't physically couldn't hold the weight of a coffee cup above my head, getting wow. it off the shelf in the morning. It was like, I felt like an 80 year old woman and I was, yeah, I, I was really, really depressed by that point. That was like coming into October and I was just like, how am I going to go to the Olympics like this? Like what? I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, uh, yeah, I guess, um, I ended up, I w- had been on like anti-inflammatories for my, the cyst in my knee for like quite a few months. And that was kind of keeping everything like semi-manageable, um, to a point where like, I just wasn't, basically I wasn't complaining about it enough, which is hilarious to look back and think about. <laughs> right. Just, <laughs> just, sto- just stoically putting up with it. Just thinking. Yeah. Right. And I, and I, and I did, but like we just, it like, it's hard to diagnose. And when we tested for it the first time it came back negative. Um, and I don't have like, there's like markers in your blood that can, um, sh- reveal that you have it if, if it's genetic and I don't have that marker. I'm one right. of very few people that don't have it. So, um, yeah, it was just, it was just a tough thing to diagnose and the doctors were doing everything they could, but they just couldn't figure it out. And, um, yeah, I got to a point where I had to go off all my anti-inflammatories to get this, um, therapy on my shoulders. Cause they still were not better after seven months. <laughs> and they, when I did that, my body literally like exploded. Like wow. that was when I couldn't get out of bed or walk downstairs or I would have morning stiffness for like five hours a day. It was just, it was a nightmare. It was so, so awful. And my wrist like seven months post-op like blew up. It was so inflamed. It was like the size it was after surgery. So I went to see my surgeon and I ended up just breaking down to him and, and was like, I, I know I'm sick and no one can figure out what's wrong with me. And he kind of heard me out. He did some x-rays and he was like, I think you have rheumatoid. It's the only thing that I can think that it could be. And he talked to my doctors and we retested and he was right. Um, and yeah, luckily like that was end of November. So I was like supposed to be going to do tour essentially. (laughs) And I hadn't really ridden yet. And, uh, so we got my, me on meds and did a bunch of tests and, uh, but then they found out that I was like severely anemic as well. Um, which you can't have anemia and go to altitude. <laughs> right. <laughs> which makes it very difficult to snowboard. <laughs> um, and now I like almost lost the plot when they told me that. I was like, what else can happen right now? Like, <laughs> Right, right. Wow. <laughs> but um, luckily, like, I mean, when you're going to the Olympics, like the medical system just goes above and beyond. And we fast tracked everything. And we, I got, um, actually got an IV drip of iron for my stores. So like... Um, when you take it orally, it, it takes about three months to restock your iron stores if you're anemic. Right. But with the, with the drip, it, it's just like, it takes like, it, you have to go sit in a hospital for like six hours and they just drip it in IV intravenously. So I did that and then was it cleared to go to altitude, but yeah, it was just a nightmare at the end yeah. of the day. But, um, so, I eventually so th- got on medication and made it to the Olympics. Somehow. I was going to say, so they, tr- so they, it's a, co- it's a question of working out the kind of the medicine combination that will they'll deal with it. Is, it. is that how you manage it now? Yeah. So that's, I think it's such an interesting disease in the sense that everyone is so different, even if you have the same strain. I've actually arthritis. got a couple of friends who've got it as well. So I, I've kind of know a tiny bit about it, but it's not something that there's like a, my understanding, it's not like a one, it's not like, okay, you need this, is it? They have to, you have mm-hmm. to work it out, right? Yeah, everyone's journey is so different with it. And that's what's so heartbreaking about it because I've had so many people reach out to me and be like, what are you on? Like, I need to be on what you're on. And it's like, I've met people who have the same thing as me and theirs is more severe. And they're on like seven different drugs in conjunction with the one I'm on. And it's still not helping. Right. And it's, so it's just like, it's so heartbreaking in that sense that like, I can't, I know that I can't give someone a magic answer to like, make them feel better. And when you felt that and you know what it feels like, it's, it's heartbreaking to know you can't really help. Yeah. Um, but like maybe, I mean, maybe some people I can, but not everybody. Um, 
So yeah, it took a little bit of a process to like, the first thing they put me on when I first went down to Colorado, like didn't work. And my symptoms came back while I was there. And then they were just like, okay, we're not messing around. Like they just gave me like the gnarly stuff for the Olympics so I could, so I could compete. Yeah. Which, yeah, it was crazy. Cause then it's like, you don't want to go off it once you have it. You're like, this works. Like I feel 25 again. I feel amazing. Like I don't want to go back to that place of waking up in pain and not knowing if I'm going to be able to like grab my coffee cup. Never mind, jump a 70 foot jump. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm now like, it took about probably a year and a half for me to find like the right combination. And I'm on something that for the last three years has worked amazingly for me. Like I wouldn't say my arthritis inhibits me in any way as far as my sport goes. Yeah. And that's the Mm. prognosis from now on. That's how you're going to have to handle it. Yeah. I mean, I would like to explore kind of maybe some more natural ways of dealing with it. Um, I just wanted to get through these Olympics and, and, um, you know, it's just so nice to be able to, to wake up every morning and know that I'm not going to be in pain. It's, it's a hard thing to give up. Um, cause there's a good chance that if I go off it, I'm going to go back, maybe not as severe, like the flare ups are always different, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a hard thing to be like, to actively choose that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And how, how was it mentally when you started snowboarding again? It, it was hard. Like I think well, with the anemia too, like I had to come back really slowly. So I was like one, one run a day, two runs a day, three runs a day, one jump a day. Like it was like really baby steps. Um, so that was really hard for me to like hold back and we were at due to her. So I like was watching everyone compete and, um, but yeah, it, it was really stressful actually. I mean, just trying to get back to a competitive level after taking essentially like t- I took like 10 months off from competing and seven off snow more or less. And so it was definitely like kind of daunting, but I don't know. I think that my, my answer to kind of everything when I'm under like that much pressure is just like put the blinders on and go to work. And yeah. And that, that's a big reason I didn't talk about it. I like, I did not want to be reminded of it and I didn't yeah. want to, have to speak about it so I just I I did the same thing with my knee at these Olympics I just didn't tell anyone and went to work and yeah I guess that's kind of my way of coping with that kind of stuff until I have time to process it myself yeah which is where you are now with the knee yeah 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 now now it's all fixed up (laughs) yeah 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 I know I still have a an Instagram post drafted that I've just never put up I'm like I'll put it up eventually (laughs) Yeah, probably like psychologically when you know that the, you know, it's almost done then you f- might feel you can put it up. Yeah, I don't know. I think I got to a point too where I was like, I don't know, do I need to like broadcast everything to the world too? And then, Well, that's another conversation, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but it was, it's been funny. Like I'll like run into people and I'm, I'm not like hiding it. I mean, obviously I just told you, but like um, I'll like run into people and tell them and they'll be like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't know. And it's like, don't worry, I, I didn't put it on Instagram, so there's no way you would have known. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But people are so used to it these days, aren't they? Just seeing yeah. people and going like, well, I did it to you earlier. Yeah, you've been sailing. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, well, yeah, once. Yeah. I like, I'm like. i glad that people think I sail, though, because that, that is the end goal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it works on me, for sure. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I just I had a couple of other questions, if that, if you've still got time. We've been going um, a while with all the all these layers. Yeah, I've got, it, like, I got like 15 more minutes. Well, I wanted to ask you about your uh, First Nations heritage, actually. Um, If that's something that you're uh, interested in talking about. I think it's really special to get to represent my culture and my heritage um, on that stage. Um, But, uh, yeah, I think that's kind of been probably the thing I like the most about the games is just getting to meet the kids and, and know that, I mean, yeah, like just knowing that my journey is like inspiring kids to to kind of go after what they want. Um, and it's really fun to get to go back to like the community I'm from is 800 people. Right. 
Um, so it's very, very small. And so to get to, I go, go speak at the schools every few years and yeah, just to get to see those kids and like for them to know that like I come from the same place that they came from and that they can do it too. It's, it's just really special to be able to give that back. Cause yeah, exactly. I think for a lot of first nations, it's, and a lot of minorities in general, it's just like the stereotypes are so heavy and you grow up hearing them all the time. And it's just, I think it's so important for those kids just to have a role model or like to have a story that they can relate to and, and look at f- towards their own journeys, whatever that may be. Yeah. I um, mean, it, like you say, with minorities it tends to be just less positive role models, right? You know, if you, if you're white, basically you, you just have so many different role models to choose from, you know, and, and so many different stories you can tell so many different places you can put yourself, you know, like you say. Yeah. And I think, I think that people, I think too, it's like, there are really incredible people out there that like from every minority or culture, but I think with minorities, it's like, you just hear about the bad stuff so much more. Yeah. And it tends to be the sort of narrative, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's like, there was like a a really cool quote that like resonates so much with me about that. It's that bad news travels around the world twice before good news has a chance to put on its shoes. And I feel like that is like, the perfect representation of that. It's like these kids just hear about all these bad statistics that they're going to become instead of hearing about, you know, there's hundreds and thousands, thousands probably of people who have done amazing things and who are from communities just like them and situations just like them, but you just don't hear about it. So that's been really cool for me to get to just speak with those kids and, and let them know that it doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is. So I got I got to finish with the classic looking sideways question that I always ask everybody. But um, yeah, what's what's next? You got any ambitions left in snowboarding that you want to achieve? Yeah, I do. Um, I definitely want to kind of compete until I just kind of want to do it on my terms, I guess, and and end on my terms. So I'm not sure when that's going to be yet, but it's definitely an interesting position to like these last year and a half. It's like whoa, like there's way more events behind me than that are in front of me, I guess. Um, yeah. It's kind of funny when you realize that. And, uh, but I definitely want to end that part of my career on my own terms and in my own way. Um, and then from there, I like, I've always wanted to film and I've always wanted to learn more about the backcountry. And I know that's like probably the most stereotypical answer that every snowboarder gives, but, um, yeah, I made that choice when I was like 19. I was like, I'm not going to film yet. I'm going to go compete. And I ended up competing for way longer than I thought I would, but, um, I still love it. So here I am. And, um, but yeah, that, that part of snowboarding is definitely calling my name pretty quick here. I've always wanted to go to AK and, um, just, yeah, learn more about backcountry and I want to rack Sonny's brain a little bit and make him teach me. (laughs) Yeah. Well, plenty of role models there. Yeah. And I know, like, I think it's going to be cool when this kind of group of girls starts to transition. Like, there's just so much about the girls that compete, I think, that people overlook. It's like, like, any to me is going to change the backcountry. Like, she is probably the best female snowboarder all around right now in the world. And uh, she's so quiet that everyone just kind of forgets about her. But um, we got some plans to get back there and to go on some trips together. And um, I'm pretty excited about that because I think that's important when you go back there to have someone that you trust and that you want to learn with. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of girls in Slope and Pipe even who who can have an impact back there. So I think it's going to be cool when that changing of the guard starts to happen. Yeah, you're right. It's going to be great to see, actually, isn't it? It's going to be really exciting to see what everybody comes up with. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of the next step of where I'm starting to think of going. And, uh, yeah. We'll just go go from there. Hey, well, thanks a lot for doing this. Sorry I put you through the uh, the technical oh, exam no at the beginning. But yeah, that All was great. Good. I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, thank you. It was nice to chat. So there you go. That was me and Spencer. And yeah, what a, what a great sport she was there, answering each of those questions so thoroughly. And what a brilliant spokesperson for competitive snowboarding in all its contradictory glory she really is. I hope you could uh, dig some of the issues there from that Skype chin. Actually, I don't know why I keep calling it Skype because we didn't even 
fucking use Skype in the end because it didn't work properly and was a complete nightmare. I mean, how long has that thing been going and how can it still be that bad? So we ended up using FaceTime and even that was tricky because my phone was dying and I've got one of those new iPhones that you can't charge it and plug headphones at the same time. So um, despite being completely scuppered by technology, we worked it out in the end. Spencer was completely patient and uh, made it work. And yeah, I'm really grateful for that. So thank you, Spencer. Yeah, I mean, I've been covering snowboarding's relationship with the Olympics for years now in various forms and, and through various outlets. And throughout that time, the thing you always hear is like, who cares? Why does it matter? You know, just it's just snowboarding, man. You know, just just don't worry about it. Just go and ride powder. But I think, you know, Spencer got to the heart of it a couple of times during that conversation. Because, you know, ultimately, if you don't watch out, it really is cultural death by a thousand cuts. You can hear it in her account of the younger riders who just think it's normal. They don't even remember a time in the not so distant past when there was actually a tour full of independent competitive events that at least tried to represent snowboarding culture correctly. And the other reason it's important is because, you know, this is about what happens when our cultures get appropriated by the mainstream. Now, this is obviously a perennial theme of the podcast, as you're going to know if you've been listening for a while. It comes up time and again in different conversations and different contexts. In this particular context, snowboarding really is the canary in the coal mine. And the news just isn't that great when you hear how the athletes are being treated. And basically the disconnect that the Olympic demonstrates between our culture and the mainstream sporting culture, which is increasingly subsuming us. I was reminded of this recently, actually, when I had a conversation with a really senior figure in UK sport, when I mentioned that plenty of people in action sports had this view that the IOC was a bit of a cultural menace and people were concerned about the effect it was having in the way Spencer describes. She looked at me like I was insane and confidently told me it didn't matter anyway because the younger kids coming up didn't know any difference as if that's the point anyway it's going to be really fascinating seeing how skateboarding surfing and climbing handle it as we've also talked about at various points in the next episode i interviewed neftali williams and one of the things we talked about was skateboarding in the olympics and it was really interesting hearing how bullish and how confident he was about skateboarding's ability to withstand these influences i really really hope he's right but it's going to be pretty fascinating watching it all unfold over the next few years. Anyway, that's enough for this week. Big thanks to Spencer for coming on the show. Big thanks to everyone who continues to listen to and support the podcast. Share, review, buy a t-shirt over at T-Mill. Above all, keep listening. I'll be back next time. See you later. 